God directed his people at different times to build things on the earth he could use. He instructed his people to be strong and courageous, to do the work and to give willingly for the work. So, this morning as we have launched the Build to Impact project, the construction work we're going to get into, I want to take a few moments just to spend some time in God's word along this line. And uh, just to begin with, as I said earlier, right from the beginning, at APC, we always place the emphasis on people. Uh, in early days, people used to come and ask, why aren't you thinking of buying land, building? I said, no, no, let's focus on people. Let's focus on people. Don't worry about those things. And even when we go around in our conferences, ministering to people, we always make certain statements. One statement that we, we like to do, say is kingdom building is about building people. Let's say it together. Kingdom building is about building people. So when you talk about building God's kingdom, uh, it's not about the, the physical structures. It's always about building people. The structure, the buildings uh, are only tools to achieve this purpose, which is to build people. Kingdom building is about pe building people. And the other important thing we've emphasized a lot is that every believer is a minister. That means every one of us has a ministry. God has called us to do something. Right? Uh, wherever you are, in the workplace, in school, college, home, neighborhood, something, all of us have been called by God to serve him. Every believer is a minister. And that will always remain our focus. We're not going to go away from that even when we, you know, have our facilities and have our buildings and do all these things. You know, technology, buildings, all of those are just tools to achieve this objective, which is to build the kingdom of God by building his people or which is to equip God's people so that every believer can be a minister of God and serve the purposes of God. But what I want us to just ponder on this morning is to think about this fact that God, who is eternal, God who, who is so great that even the heavens can't contain, the God who is spirit and who has invited us to worship him in spirit and truth, yet has in times past asked for things to be built for him on earth. That's interesting to think about, and we just want to look at that and take some lessons away with us as we together get in to uh, the Build to Impact project on building this equipping center and world outreach. What are some lessons we can take away from things that God has done in the past? Take, for example, the tabernacle that God told Moses to put up in the wilderness. I mean, why would God want it? You know, he's God. He fills the heavens. He's spirit. He's, he's eternal. Why would he want something on the earth, a tabernacle? Why would he want a temple? Think about Solomon who built the temple. Why would he want it? And why would he want that to be rebuilt once it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar? So he had Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets, encouraging God's people to rebuild that temple. Why would he want that? And I know these are Old Testament examples, but even in the New Testament, although we are uh, God's temple, the people of God are the temple of God, Yet, we see throughout history, God has used things, places, structures, methods, technology. He's used that for the purposes of his kingdom. So I want us to think about that and how God goes about engaging his people on that. So we could keep these lessons in mind as we journey together uh, uh, on, on, on this Build to Impact project. Let's go to Exodus chapter 25. Um, and look at how God worked or got his people to work together to build the tabernacle. Exodus 25, we'll read verses 1 through 9. Exodus 25, verses 1 through 9. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which will take from them gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, the acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate. Let them make for me, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to the, all that I've shown you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. 
So God is speaking, tell Mo Moses, tell my people, bring me an offering. But notice how he wants his people to do it. He says, from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. Out of your own heart, the willingness of your own heart, you bring what you want. And God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God is saying, build me something so that I can dwell. There is a purpose for this building that I want them to build. And so we progress there uh, in this whole journey. To go to chapter 35, please, Exodus. I want to highlight some things here on how the people uh, responded to Moses' invitation. Exodus chapter 35, we'll pick out a few verses. In verse 5, Exodus 35, verse 5, read verse 4 and 5. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him take it as an offering to the Lord. Verse 21. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing and they brought the Lord's offering. Verse 29, the children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord. All men and women whose hearts were willing to bring for the Lord. A couple of things I want to point out. First of all, he said in verse 5, whoever is of a willing heart. So everybody say willing heart. So there is absolutely no compulsion on any of us. Amen? So tell your neighbor, just relax. <laughs> All right, these next four years, I don't want you to feel under any pressure. You know, we are doing this together. Each one of us are going to give out of a willing heart. If your heart is not willing, don't give. If your heart's willing, give. Out of a willing heart, there is absolutely no pressure to give. Secondly, in verse 5, he says, you bring it as to the Lord. It is the Lord's offering. You're giving to the Lord. You're not giving to APC. Thank God. You're not giving to the pastor. Thank God. You are giving to the Lord. So when you make your contribution or contributions, whatever you do towards this project, do it out of a willing heart. And do it as to the Lord. It's between you and God. Right? It's to the Lord. Right? Remember, what you invest, you're investing into God's kingdom, the work of His kingdom. You know, there'll be a time when you and I pass away, we leave this world. But what we have sown can continue to impact lives to generations to come, you know, until the Lord returns. It can continue to be a blessing and continue to be used for uh, decades to come uh, to bless the lives. And you're investing to the Lord. You're giving to the Lord. And notice he says here, verse 21, everyone whose heart was stirred. So that means you give as your heart is stirred. If you don't find your heart stirred, don't give. But if your heart is stirred, that you feel like, yes, I want to do something for this. Uh, how much I want to do, it's up to how much your heart is stirred. Some of you may feel so stirred about this vision, you, you will stretch yourself, you sacrifice, you give. Some of you feel like, oh man, I got to slept through that. <laughs> it, it didn't move me a bit. Okay, relax, no pressure, right? Do what your heart is stirred to do. Verse 21 says, everyone came whose heart was stirred. Their heart was stirred. And so they came and they gave towards this work. And verse 29 once again says, the people brought a free will offering. This is completely your free will, right? There is going to be no compulsion, no coercion, no forcing, nothing. Just your own free will. Out of your own willingness of your own heart, you give towards what we're going to do. And then we see what happened here. Uh, if you go to chapter 39, uh, just turn a few pages there. Chapter Exodus 39, verses 42 and 43. Uh, it is good to see that the work was completed according to all, Exodus 39, 40, verses 42 and 43. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. Then Moses looked over all the work, and indeed they had done it as the Lord had commanded, just so they had done it 
and Moses blessed them. You know, one very interesting thing about this whole scenario is this. That when God brought the people out of Egypt, he actually put the wealth in their hands. He actually put it all in their hands. So when Moses came on later, came later on in, you know, Exodus 25, 35, and he tells the people, bring an offering. They already had it. See, they already had it. God already put it in their hands. And they just brought what each one had. Right? What each one had, they brought it. So I believe God has set us all up in different ways. Prepared us to give what we can, what he wants us to give. And as you feel willing in your heart, as you feel stirred up in your heart, as out of your own free will, you give to the Lord. And then we put everything all together, we will find that we can get the job done. Amen? Because God puts in each of our hands whatever we can contribute, whatever he wanted us, he's enabled us to contribute, and we will give. And we put everything together, we will get the work done. And so in chapter 40, uh, verses 33 to 35, Exodus chapter 40, verses 33 to 35, it says, And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the screen uh, of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. So the work was done. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That means God kept his side of this whole thing. He said, you build a tabernacle so that I can dwell. I can keep my presence over there. So they did the work, and then God did his part. He released his presence and his glory into that tabernacle. So even as we build this facility that we are looking forward to, God will release his purposes through it to impact our city, our nation, and even the nations of the world. Let's go now to 1 Chronicles 28 to look at Solomon's temple. Uh, in 1 Chronicles 28, we see, and I'm just summarizing here, we're going to read only a few verses from this chapter. We see that David, towards the latter part of his reign, he desired to build a physical temple for God. And he wanted to do it. That was in his heart. But God said, David, you're not going to do it because you've been a man of war. You've fought so many great, fought all these battles. But instead, you make the preparations and your son Solomon is the one who's going to build it. And so that's what David did. He got everything organized. And then his son Solomon stepped in to build. But let's pick up a few verses now. In First Chronicles 28, we'll read verse 10, 11, and a part of verse 12. It says here, David is speaking to Solomon. He says, consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Solomon, God's chosen you. Be strong and do it. Get the work done. Do it. And then he says, verse 11, the David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers. And the place of the mercy seat, verse 12, and the plans for all that he had by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gave David the idea, gave him the plans, and he passed it on to Solomon so Solomon could get the job done. And look at verse 20. What was David speaking to Solomon? And David said to his son, this is First Chronicles 28, verse 20, and David said to his son Solomon, be strong and have a good courage. And do it. Do not fear, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. This verse is a verse I want you to highlight, hold on to as we make this journey for the next four years. Be strong. Be of a good courage. Be courageous. And do it. So if, I hope we hit no roadblocks, but if we hit some roadblocks, come back to this verse. Be strong. Be courageous. Do it. Because God will not leave you until you finish the work. Come back to this. Right? So we'll keep you updated how we progress. And, and I, 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 you know, it'll be great. Just everything goes smooth. But if there are some challenges, hey, come back. Be strong. Be courageous. Get the job done. God is with you until you finish this work. Don't quit. So imagine this assignment being given to Solomon. He said, like, David, why didn't you find somebody else? You know? Or outsource it. You know, send it somewhere else. 
But David, David says, Solomon, Solomon, you be strong. You be courageous. You do this work. Finish it. God is with you. And it's very interesting to see what happens. Chapter 29, as David invites the people to uh, give towards this work. I will just pick up a few verses. First Chronicles uh, chapter 29. Uh, we we'll look at verse 9 and verse 14. So look at verse 9. It says, First Chronicles 29, verse 9. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced greatly. So once again, they offered willingly. Now I want you to keep that in your heart. Do whatever you do, do it willingly. Do it with joy, not out of compulsion. There is going to be no comparison how much A is giving and how much B is giving. That I will not see. Okay, pledge cards can be put very confidentially in that box or you do it online. The accounting department will see, you know, I don't keep, sometimes people think pastor checks who gives how much. I want to tell you, I don't have time for that. <laughs> okay, all right. We don't check. I mean, th there's a separate accounting department. People, accountants do that job. That's not my job. So I don't check on who gives what, and that's not my business. My call is to stay focused on the things of God and do the work of God, right? So there is no comparison, nothing. You just do what's will what you want to do willingly out of your heart. Do it cheerfully. And also keep this in mind as you do. Verse 14, David says in his prayer, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. So Lord, all things come from you and of your own we give to you. I was, whatever you have, say God, this is what I have. This is what you've given me. Not of what you've given me, I am giving to you your work. Do it that way. And so they built that temple. God kept his side of the deal and since he filled that temple with his glory and it was an amazing place of worship uh, during Solomon's time. Now let's go to the book of Haggai. This is the last one that we're going to see. Haggai is a very interesting book because at this time, what had actually happened was Solomon's temple had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king who invaded Jerusalem and Judah. He destroyed Solomon's temple and he had taken all the people captives off into Babylon. They were there for 70 years and at the end of the 70 year period, Cyrus, the king of Persia, in the first year of his reign, he issues a decree saying, all you Jews, you go back to your city, you go back to Jerusalem, you rebuild your city and you rebuild your temple. Now that was unheard of, unthinkable. It's like the prime minister of India saying, Christians come, I'm going to give you land all over India. Build your churches where you want. I mean, it's like that. You know, Cyrus saying, Jews go back, build your city and build your temple and I'll help you. So, some of the Jews were excited. Head back to Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, some of the names you are familiar with, Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they were the leaders. Uh, uh, a lot of Jewish people came back. And when they came back, they started the work. But they got distracted because, like all of us, we also have families to take care of. So they also had to rebuild their own homes, had to take, you know, get their own lives back together. And so what happened, they abandoned the rebuilding of the temple for 16 years. So first year they started a bit of that work. But then they forgot. They got so busy with taking care of their own things. 16 years abandoned. So then that's where Haggai the prophet and Zechariah come on the scene. God raised these two prophets. I mean Haggai's ministry lasted for about three months. Imagine being a prophet only three months. <laughs> but he got the job done. Okay. So Haggai comes up on the scene. Zechariah the prophet come. Their job is get these people to finish the work of the temple. So that's all they prophesy. That's the message. That's all. So Haggai prophesies. And at that time, Zerubbabel, a man named Zerubbabel, was the governor of 
Jerusalem. Joshua was a priest there. And so Haggai comes with a message from God. He speaks to Zerubbabel. He speaks to Joshua. And he also speaks to people. He says, guys, it's time to come back and rebuild this temple. You've abandoned it now for the last 16 years. And he challenges them. In some way, he rebukes them. He says, is it time to build your own houses while the house of the Lord lies abandoned? Consider your ways. Think about how you're living. And, and then he challenges them. God is telling you, you go up to the mountain. Bring the timber. Bring the wood. Rebuild this temple and see if I will not bless you, uh, says the Lord. So let's pick up part of this message there in Haggai chapter 2. We'll verses 1 through 9. We'll look at a couple of these verses. Haggai chapter 2, verse 1 through 9. Verse 2. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? He says, look, you saw the temple when it was first built. Look at it now. Aren't you bothered? Aren't you affected by this? Is what he's saying. Verse 4. Yet now, be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of peace. Again, similar to what... So David told Solomon, be strong and go to sleep. No. <laughs> be strong and work. Be strong and work. Because I am with you. And he reminds them, the next verse, verse 5, he says, my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. So my spirit is with you. Many of us are familiar with a very parallel promise that Zechariah the prophet brought, brought about. Same time, Zechariah prophesied, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. He says, not by might, not by power, but by my Same, same prophecy, same group of people. Here he says, my spirit is with you. Zechariah says, it's not by might, it's not by power. It's by my spirit we'll get this job done. He has laid the foundation stone. He will also lay the capstone. That is the finishing stone, the final stone. He will do it. Who art thou a great mountain before Zerubbabel? You will become a plain. So if there's a great obstacle, saying you're going to become a plain. He's going to come shouting grace, grace to it. Because it's not by might, it's not by power. It's by my spirit. And so similar word Haggai brings. My spirit is with you. And then verse 7. He says, I will shake all nations. And they will come to the desire of all nations. I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord. Verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 9. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord. And in this place, I will give you peace. A couple of things to point out. Things that we will take a hold of in our prayer time. God, we want to impact nations. That's what he says in verse 7. Nations will come. They will come to the desire of all nations. Who is the desire of all nations? Jesus. They will come. Nations will come. So our prayer is God through this that we build. We want to impact nations. Then God says, you know, I will fill this with my glory. In fact, he says, the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. That means the glory that you put in this temple as rebuilt will be greater than the glory that, is, that Solomon saw when he built it. So God, we want that glory. And then verse 8, he says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. So anytime you feel intimidated by this 40 crore thing, just remind yourself. The silver and the gold belongs to God. Amen? So say, God, how are we going to do this? I mean, we're not like, you know, one million church. <laughs> you know, we have put all the people together. Across all our locations, a little over a thousand people. God, how are we going to do this? Well, just remember, the silver belongs to God and the gold belongs to? He just has to shake them. <laughs> shake the nations. I will shake the nations. Say, God, shake all the people. I don't know, just joking. But just remind, remind yourself. God said, the silver is mine and the gold is so don't get intimidated by the numbers. Um, God owns it. God will provide. God will bring it in. That we look at that word. God says the silver is mine 
the gold this month. He will get it done. Amen? Now, let me just make three statements on why we're doing this and then we will close. So why are we building uh, our World Outreach and Equipping Center? Why are we doing it? First, keep in mind that, you know, of course, that's our mandate as a church. We are called to equip people and, uh, uh, so that we can impact nations. But I want us to keep this thought, these three things in mind. First of all, in Matthew 9, verses 35 and 36, when Jesus sees a great multitude and he sees that, you know, the fields are white all ready to harvest, he responds with this thing. He says, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the harvest. We need more laborers. Right? So one thing is we can pray, like he instructed us, pray for laborers. But just remember, laborers need to be equipped. Trained, equipped, sent, and supported. Amen? You have to have laborers who are trained. So that's one reason, one big reason why we want to have this. We want to increase what we're doing in terms of training laborers. Training, equipping, sending, and supporting laborers. Laborers who can go into all the urban centers of our city, of our nation, and maybe other nations. Laborers who can also go into the villages and other parts of our nation. We want to scale that up, what we are doing, so that we can send forth laborers. Like you saw, if we can release 200 people at least every year, in 10 years, they could potentially impact 2 million lives. If we keep releasing 200 trained, equipped laborers every year into our nation and other parts of the world, they can impact. The multiplication factor is huge. But laborers need to be trained, equipped, sent, and supported. And we want to do that. And secondly, we want to leverage technology to equip God's people globally. So make use of the tools available to equip believers across the world to impact their sphere of influence. So all of you sitting here, you are a minister of God. You have your sphere of influence where some other preacher may never be able to enter into. So when you go to your school, your college, your place of work, you, are, you have people that you are interacting with. And you can impact their lives. But you need to be equipped to impact them. So all of us need. And thank God that's what we do over the week after week to equip God's people. But with technology, we can multiply that equipping and equip many more of God's people to make a difference in their world. And lastly, like we said earlier, urban centers across our nation need more churches you know this past week i was uh, uh, traveling went to Bellari and then went to chitadurga so i was traveling to different these things these 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 towns or these small cities or you know you consider them as tier three cities but they're so developed and uh, uh, they've developed tremendously and then people are moving in opportunities are there but they need churches they need quality churches, meaning churches will really bring the word of God to the people. Now, otherwise, you have things just spawning here and there. Uh, unfortunately, many times, the people who are starting those churches are not even trained. They just felt they needed to do a church. And so when you go on the ground, you see what's happening. You see the needs. So you need trained laborers. But you also have the ability to get a satellite churches set up very quickly using technology. Now, people on the ground to do the work. But we need churches across our nation, more churches. Our cities are so big. We need multiple centers around a single city to serve the city. And with technology, we can reach out. Amen? So, as we journey through this project, keep these thoughts in mind. When you give, give willingly. Give as you are stirred in your heart. Give out of your own free will. And give as to the Lord. When you feel intimidated by the challenge, just remember, be strong, be courageous, do the work, because the Lord is with you, and He will not leave you until you finish the work. Remember, the Spirit of the Lord is among you. The Spirit of the Lord is among us. The Holy Spirit is with us. He will help us get this work done, and nations will be affected. God's glory will be manifested. And the silver and the gold is in the hands of the Lord. He will release it into our hands to get the job done. Amen?
If you agree with it, you can stand up. Otherwise, you can remain seated. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the hour in which you have placed us on the earth. Thank you for what we can look back in history and see what people have done in the past. But Father, this is our time. This is our day. It's our moment to do something for the sake of your kingdom in our city, in our nation, and in the nations of this world. And Father, we thank you for the encouragement that comes from your word. That as you've done it in the past, you can do it again and even more. And we pray, Father, together that you will move upon us, move upon all the others who are connected and ministered to through the work being released here at APC, God. And you'll give us a willing heart. That you will stir up our hearts. That you will bless us so that we could sow in to the work of this project. That you will lead us and guide us to see this work finished. And to see many thousands, many millions affected, touched and reached with the word of God, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father. For giving us this opportunity to make history in our day, in our time. Thank you for empowering us. And Father, I speak over each one here. And I declare that you bless us in our journey with you, in our spiritual walk with you, in our workplaces, in our homes, our families, our marriages. I speak over our lives and I declare the blessing of the Lord over each of our lives. I stand against every work of the enemy, every scheme, every device of the enemy to try to attack us personally, our homes, our families, our marriages in any way. And I say the devil will have no access, no entrance into our lives. That no evil shall befall us, no plague will come near our dwelling. That the angel of the Lord encamps around us and delivers us. That we are blessed coming in. We are blessed going out. And God, that you always cause us to triumph. And you make manifest the fragrance of our knowing you in every place. And God, we pray that each of us will have impact and influence for your kingdom here on earth. That we will touch lives, win souls, make disciples right where you've placed us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close, please, with a benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.